United States, in Europe, um, from the human rights community, people speaking out in a way that made governments in, non, in, in non-transparent environments responsive. And that was a vital changing point, um, I think, for, for many members of, of the Africa group. Um, we've talked about the importance of NGOs. Um, OSF, uh, Open Society Foundation, was a root um, a contributor to this because not only did they um, support the conference that we had at Cardozo, uh, that Justin um, also hosted, but really the work of the NGOs. And it was in an environment in which most foundations were not supporting work in intellectual property. It took Vera France's leadership at OSF to get this done because without the support for the NGOs, the robust kind of um, um, communication um, that we were getting and really representation and pressure would not have occurred. And I think um, um, OSF is fair in particular, someone that we all owe um, a, a significant vote of thanks. <laughs> the libraries were vital. Once the libraries jumped in, nothing warms the heart of, the libra of a librarian's daughter like libraries. Right? So my mother was a librarian and once she heard about it, she's like, you are not allowed to not do anything but make sure this comes out well. So mom had spoken, I had a personal commitment to my mother, but seriously, this is a system that will work because libraries work. For much, for all of Africa, libraries will be mostly the authorized entities. And the role of libraries is significant, and frankly, that became one of the levers within the Africa group that um, I was able to use to say, if you don't do this, you can't really do anything for libraries anyways, because much of what libraries do um, is going to come to bear in this treaty for the visually impaired. Um, and lastly is a comment that I think will resonate with all of us in this room, and that is at the end of the day, the moral legitimacy of this project was significant. I, I firmly believe that when you are on the morally correct side, when you're doing the right thing, no matter how difficult it is, it makes it easier to sort of deal with all of the challenges that come along the way. And I will tell you, no matter how much we all disagreed about different things in that room, I will tell you that Justin Hughes was morally committed to this, that Jamie Love was morally committed to this, that Nancy was morally committed to this, that Luis was morally committed to this. I mean, that was clear. And it was a moral claim that was not just a claim by the negotiators in that room, it was a moral claim by the public. That people have a right to access those things that will make their lives better, that will give them dignity, and that will really reflect well on the kind of societies that we all come from. And that, at the end of the day, I think was the platform that brought us to Marrakesh. Briefly, uh, <clears throat> I, responding to the question, what make a difference, you know, why at the end we, we, we came to, to a closing. I think one, one thing that uh, it, it helped is that countries stop negotiating north-south, but you saw some countries from the north agreeing with some of the south and some of the south with the north, and, and that really make a difference, you know, like to see Canada or Switzerland co coming to the other side and some, uh, I don't want to mention who, who the South went to the other side, but, but you know, that, that, but, but you, you saw that kind of thing, and, and, and also was a lot of compromise. Uh, you know, some negotiators, we had some strong feeling about some things, and we just let it go because we wanted to have a treaty for the blind. So I think flexibility at the end uh, on the all parties, what, what allowed the, the, the success. Uh, and, and finally, I think I, we, we had to, to mention uh, other people that we have not mentioned, uh, I think what's critical for the success, you know, India, you know, Raghavender, the, the, the copyright, uh, he was amazing, you know, yoga master, the guru of, you know, he, he always kept calm and, and with good ideas. Uh, also the leadership of Martin Moscoso, who was the, the facilitator, he, he also uh, played a, a, a really good, uh, you know, job, you know, he, he made a lot of work. and. Uh, also, we, I have to, to, to recognize the work of IFLA, because IFLA at some point could have had a choice whether, you know, really engage and support the blind, and, and they did, because they, they, there was the, the idea of, of joining the libraries and the blind, 
And if I was uh, generous enough to say no, we, we, we want to tell everybody that we have to have a treaty for the blind. And, and, and that really was a critical thing in the process. Uh, so we have to recognize, of, of course, uh, we already mentioned uh, James uh, and, and Ruth, and, but also have, was missing Peter Jassy, who also had a critical role. He always, you know, from the absolute beginning, from 2000 and, and, oh, 2001, he has been, you know, supporting developing countries on copyright issues. Uh, so, so thank you to you, Peter, again. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. And Luis failed to mention what, for the United States' perspective, was our chief partner in this uh, project, and that was Brazil. And uh, Estanislao do Amaral, uh, who was the deputy of the Geneva mission and has gone on to a more difficult job, Brazilian ambassador to Syria, uh, because they said, you handled WIPO. Um, <laughs> And then his successor, Kenneth Nobrega, and uh, I consider both Estanislaw and Kenneth dear friends now, and it, it really was um, the ability of Brazil and the United States to get together that, uh, that for us uh, made it all possible. So I agree with every, everyone Luis named. Uh, Raghavendar is a dear friend too, but you never know what he's going to say. Uh, <laughs> But it was really uh, uh, Stanislaw and Kenneth for the U.S. delegation that raised our comfort level. So, okay, yes, that's all, yes. Um, that's all, yes. Oh. And then if you run your finger over it again, it turns it off.
I'm sorry, this interrupted all what you were saying. Thank you. We didn't get to know that there's something in my details and people who want to know what they talk about. It's like, I didn't know what's going on outside. Okay, so we're going to start the next panel right now so that we can exit for the reception relatively on time. <laughs> exactly on time. <laughs> so we're going to start talking from the panel right now whether or not you're still talking in this room. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, so we're going to follow the same format, albeit a little bit yeah, longer. Equally distinguished panel, and so the first person I'm going to call on for our 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 mini keynote is Dr. Mark Maurer, the president of the National Federation of the Blind, an office he he has held since 1986, and also uh, someone who has served in many leadership roles w within the World Blind Union over the years. Dr. Maurer has has transformed the National Federation of the Blind into an extraordinary leadership organization for disabilities in the United States. And since this panel is about what comes next, we're, we're anxious to hear his perspective on that question. Dr. Mauer. Thank you very much. Um, I understood I was supposed to explain um, my perspective on why this thing is important. Exactly. All right. And I want to thank Justin for the work he did. I think he did good work, and I uh, told the undersecretary that. Uh, I understand since then he's left government, which shows you how effective the whole thing is. Uh, so my words didn't seem to make a difference. Earlier today, he was saying that uh, the original draft the World Blind Union put together was um, awful. And um, I don't know whether I've ever told him that I didn't write it, which I did not, but I did cause a lot of it to be written, and I thought it was pretty good. Uh, but I do think the current document's better, and in particular, the title has the word blind in it. 
Lots of people want to leave the word blind out of everything. And yet, the title of this document has the word blind right in the middle of it. Scott was saying it's the first international instrument that has been directly focused on the subject of blindness. I hang around with blind people all the time, but lots of folks try to avoid it as much as possible. I'm glad that word's there, and I think it's a valuable thing that it is. I gather Scott said at one point in Marrakesh, I've been working on this thing for five years. If blind isn't in this title, you know, I'll have to go fall on my sword or something. So anyhow, I'm glad it's there. The idea of rights for the blind, this is new in the world. It probably came to most dramatic focus first in about the 1950s. At that time, blind people were being told if you join an organization to try to make change in government programs, although you can do that all you want to, you can't work in any program that government has anything to do with. And we caused a bill to be put into the Congress Senator John Kennedy introduced it, and it was the Right to Organize Bill, which failed, and yet the concepts are currently written into the laws of the United States. In the 1960s and the 1970s and the 1980s and 1990s, rights for disabled people came to be more in the center of attention, although the Supreme Court has said that the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to disability. This treaty is one that offers an opportunity for us to have access to information. And some people think it has to do with copyright only, and I'm glad it's as simple as it is. On the other hand, it raises a lot of complex questions. When I get material that I read, I've run into this argument dozens of times, when I buy a book and it's in print, I have a right to read it in print. Do I have a right to get at it in any other way? Many people have told me that I do not. Many people have told me that if I get it, get at the information in some way other than in print, I have modified the book, I have made it a different work, and because of that modification, there is a violation of copyright if I do it individually, of course, there's all kinds of fair use arguments you can make, so there isn't any reason to come after me. But if I do it as an organization for lots of people, some think I have violated copyright because I've taken a book, changed its nature, and made it something else, even though it has the same information, and I just get at it in a different way. How important is it that I get at this information? Well, Scott was talking about the book famine. We worked with the Association of American Publishers in the 1990s to get the exception built into our own copyright law. It was a very successful effort. We were glad of the work to do it, and we think it has made a dramatic and significant difference to opportunities for people in our own country. We worked with the National Library Service as well. Current change in technology is moving at an enormously rapid rate, as you know. Books at one time were fairly straightforward. They were print. They were on paper. It will not be long until this is no longer the case. Indeed, if it is the case now. Today you have many different forms of electronic books. I note that this treaty incorporates the notion of electronic ways to present books. I've worked with the Motion Picture Association, and I've talked with Senator Dodd about how we could get a joint statement out, and I think it was effective, but that's just the beginning. We have a balance here, and the balance says that non-discrimination is on one side, 
If you say you can't participate, you can't join in, you can't be an element of whatever program it is, this is a violation of American law. And on the other side, you've got access to information. So far, there's an argument that this is barred by copyright. This treaty changes that. And it takes into account developments that are currently underway. The Motion Picture Association, I have told them that we want to work with them, and I have worked with some electronics companies, because when the books are no longer print on paper, when they are no longer words, but words with images, some of them dynamic, some of them elements that you can get at in electronic format. We still want access to that information, and we think that it has to do with rights of people to participate fully in our society. I don't think it's just a copyright treaty. I think it has vastly longer, broader implications than that, and I think that it is an excellent piece of work, and I thank all of you for bringing it into existence. Thank you, Peter. Peter's a good buddy. Uh, he's been a friend now for years. He inspires me with what we can do to get access to a lot of information that we didn't have before, and I appreciate his putting this symposium together. Thank you so much. Let me do quick introductions down the table, and then we'll get started. Teresa Hackett is the program manager for the EIFL IP program. She's based in Dublin, but she works extensively with libraries and librarians throughout the world, in particular in the developing world. Daniel Conway teaches law at the University of Hawaii and has written extensively on both business and social justice issues in copyright law. Jonathan Band private practice here in Washington, D.C., and in that capacity advises many entities and organizations on their copyright interests, in particular the library community, and in that capacity he was active in the run-up to the treaty and was present for many of the negotiating sessions. Alan Adler is the, the general counsel of the American Association of Publishers. You've already heard words of appreciation about Alan's role in and before Marrakesh from the participants in our first panel, and I think we're, we're all anxious to know where he, and in particular where his organization stands now on the treaty as it exists. Latif Matima is a dear friend of our program who teaches at Howard Law School and is the founder and director of the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice and Cheryl Perlmutter at the, the end of the table is here from the Patent and Trademark Office where, and I'm shuffling now to get the, the, the title correct, is Chief Policy Officer and Director for International Affairs. And as, as we all know, uh, PTO has, along with other entities within the government, a very, very significant policy role in the copyright space. It's evidenced as well by the role that Justin played in the treaty itself, and so we're very, very grateful that Shira was able to, to rush down from a meeting to, to join us today. And with that, let me, let me jump to what was actually the second question on the list of questions that I suggested to the panelists and, and see who, and this won't probably be a question for everyone on the panel, but it will be a question certainly for some, who would like to venture any forecasts about the issue of U.S. ratification of the Marrakesh Treaty? When is the issue likely to arise? What is the process likely to be? Is the is the the failure of the CPRD in previous Senate ratification votes likely to affect this treaty? Also a 
treaty relating to the human rights of persons with disabilities and, and anything else that, that you may have to offer about the ratification process to come. Any views? Alan. Well, a number of speakers in the uh, first panel use the word capacity, which actually has a, a variety of applications in this whole discussion. Um, the problem we were trying to get at was the lack of capacity of a large portion of the population of the world to be able to enjoy and educate themselves and get the benefits out of being able to read print works conventionally. And the discussion was about the capacity of uh, the process and the capacity of the varying constituencies involved to get together and to reach a common goal uh, of achievement in adopting the treaty. Uh, I think when we're talking about the process that now has to take place, um, we're looking at a, a, a very different set of capacities that, are, that apply to it. For one thing, uh, as of April of this year, uh, according to the United States Department of State, there are still 37 treaties pending before the Senate that have been submitted to the Senate, some of them as early as the late 1940s and early 1950s, uh, still awaiting ratification. It's not because in the case of many of them there's been no interest in trying to actually proceed with ratification. Uh, for example, in the case of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which was created in December of 1982, uh, an implementing agreement signed by the United States took 12 years, July 1994. It was submitted to the Senate in October of that year. And then two separate efforts to ratify it occurred in 2004 and 2007. Both failed, despite the fact that President Clinton had signed the treaty and President Bush had endorsed it and some 160 nations had become parties to it. So I think that one thing we need to understand from the outset is that the process is very uncertain and very difficult. Every process has a way uh, of, of sort of manifesting itself in terms of the forces that come to affect it and the way the process itself allows those forces to affect the way the process is supposed to work. In the case of the, the U.S. Senate, there's still a step that has to take place before the ratification process can even begin. Um, there is something known as C-175 authority, which the United States Department of State uh, basically has uh, uh, to decide and determine. And that is what governs the steps by which first the United States gets the uh, authorization to participate in negotiations for international treaties and agreements, but there are separate steps in furtherance of that authority uh, as that process moves forward to determine when the United States has the authority to actually adopt the treaty. Um, and in the case of the Marrakesh Treaty, my understanding is that at present, uh, although the United States signed the act uh, by which the treaty was created through the WIPO, uh, it has not yet gone through the end stage of the C-175 authority process uh, to have the President be able to submit the treaty to the Senate to begin the ratification process. Once the President is able to do that, and there's no saying, of course, when the President will do that, typically what happens is the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will hold hearings uh, on the treaty. In addition to exploring the text of the treaty as it is, uh, those hearings could explore um, any reservations or declarations or understandings that come with the treaty to the Senate when the White House sends it forward, or those hearings could produce a set of proposed reservations, declarations, or understandings that are essentially adjuncts uh, to what the treaty actually says. Uh, reservations being exactly as they sound, limitations on the commitments undertaken when one considers adopting the treaty, uh, understandings or declarations essentially being uh, ways of conveying understanding 
uh, about the treaty, an interpretation of particular matters that don't purport to exclude or modify the legal effect of the treaty, but will, of course, affect the way in which, if the treaty is ratified, the United States will then go forward as a party to the treaty uh, to implement it. One of the questions that arises typically is whether or not uh, when the Senate Foreign Relations Committee sends the treaty to the Senate floor, is the Senate even going to be able in its full capacity to consider a treaty? Or will the opponents of the treaty be able to use Senate procedure to block the capacity for that process to even begin? Ultimately, a treaty, in order to be ratified, requires the vote of two-thirds of the Senate, as we saw fairly recently with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. They fell five votes short of being able to ratify that treaty. Uh, so it's a very unpredictable process. And then, of course, there's also the issue with respect to, to treaties of this kind of how they impact U.S. law. One of the interesting things about the, the, the sort of posture that the U.S. government takes uh, in entering into negotiations of international treaties is that the preference, of course, is that they can achieve the goal and results uh, of perhaps being able to adopt a treaty, but prefer, of course, that in doing so, it doesn't require them in any way to change existing U.S. law. That was one of the things that greatly complicated the way in which the Marrakesh Treaty was negotiated from the perspective of the U.S. delegation as well as the U.S. NGOs participating in the process. And the reason was that it was understood or made understood that the Chafee Amendment, which was going to serve uh, as a basic framework model for the treaty in the sense of the role that authorized entities would play uh, in, in uh, cross-border exchange of accessible format copies, and even in that part of the treaty uh, that was designed to show countries that hadn't already done this, as the United States had done 17 years ago, to create national exceptions for the benefit of people with print disabilities in their national laws, uh, it's important to note that when we first got involved in this process, which was back in 2006, uh, a study that was done of national laws on this issue around the world had concluded at that time that only 57 national laws, close to just one-third of the membership of the WIPO, had provisions in them dealing with the issues of the needs of people with print disabilities, despite the fact that it didn't require a treaty to obligate a country to enact such a limitation or exception in their national law. So when one considers the fact that today there are 186 nations that are members uh, of the WIPO, but there are still fewer than 60 of them that have bothered to enact in their national laws provisions like the Chafee Amendment in U.S. copyright law to specifically address the issues of print disabilities in the copyright context, one has to wonder about the, the likelihood that there will be rapid action, not only in the United States, but in the other nations that have applauded the achievement at Marrakesh to actually drive that uh, achievement home by ratifying the treaty and putting it into effect, not just among a group of 20 nations, but among groups of all of the nations that are members of the WIPO. Thank you, Alan. Sure. Is this on? We think so. Great. <laughs> Uh, so first of all, I apologize for having missed the first panel, which I would have loved to have heard. And to the extent that I repeat anything that was said by Justin or others, uh, I, I beg your patience. Um, just to start off by saying that uh, the administration is absolutely delighted that we were able to conclude this treaty um, in Marrakesh this year. And we're very eager to see it become a reality. Uh, to have actual meaning on the ground. Um, as Alan said, the process of the U.S. joining takes a number of steps. It has been started already. Um, we have, of course, signed the actual treaty text while we were in Marrakesh, and we are now working uh, within the interagency group with all the relevant uh, agencies involved uh, on the next steps. 
uh, putting together the materials that we need for preparing the C-175 to uh, obtain signing authority. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking to the State Department trying to understand exactly what signing the treaty means as opposed to ratifying the treaty. And my understanding is, and I'm, again, I'm sorry if you already went through this uh, earlier, uh, that signing the treaty essentially means that you are supporting uh, the goals and contents of the treaty and won't do anything to undermine it, but it's not actually a legal obligation uh, yet. It doesn't contain any legal obligations that are binding on you yet, but it's the first step. And we are working uh, very hard on that and hope that uh, we should be in a position to sign the treaty very soon. Um, I will say Alan's statistics were a little bit daunting about all of the treaties that are languishing uh, in Congress, and only to say that uh, the more on the bright side, the track record for intellectual property treaties is relatively good, uh, especially in the copyright area. Uh, this has always been seen a bit as a um, treaty with two different aspects to it, and one is more of a copyright intellectual property treaty, the other is more of a disabilities related and uh, humanitarian and human rights treaty. Um, and obviously the Disabilities Treaty recently is, is a less heartening example, but we have a pretty good track record on copyright, and I hope that this one uh, will run into less difficulties and take considerably less time than some of these others. Uh, it is true that the treaty will take 20 countries ratifying or exceeding to go into force, but that's actually a fairly low number, again, for a copyright treaty. Uh, the 96 treaties and the 2000 Beijing Treaty required 30. So 20 uh, is two-thirds of, of 30. Uh, and we certainly would like to help however we can uh, with implementation in other countries that may have less experience uh, with laws in this area, with exceptions in this area, than we do in the United States. Um, and then, of course, it will be very interesting to watch how a functioning system uh, can be built uh, that will work well for the envisioned cross-border exchange uh, pursuant to the treaty. So I, I think I'll stop there, uh, but just a few observations. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I agree with uh, what's been said uh, uh, by, by Shira and Alan. Uh, I just want to add that uh, when I, over 20 years ago, I, I testified in the Senate in support of uh, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. I had been, uh, when I was at my old law firm, I had sort of uh, headed up a team that looked at whatever changes would be necessary for U.S. law, and we sort of concluded relatively minimal changes would be needed. Um, and, and, you know, just a couple of reservations so that there was really no impediment to ratification. Uh, like I said, I, I testified over 20 years ago. We still haven't ratified that treaty. Uh, and, and I believe that it was originally signed under the Carter administration. Uh, so even when I was testifying, that was already probably 15 years after it had been, after it had been signed. Um, so, so in that respect, I, I agree completely with Alan that the, you know, the ratification process is, is uh, uh, fraught with peril. On the other hand, um, it, it, you know, the, 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 the C-175 and the signing authority, I mean, that, my understanding, is completely within the uh, control of the administration. And so uh, I really hope that uh, the administration uh, does that as quickly as possible and that the, that the, uh, uh, the U.S. signs the treaty as quickly as possible because, again, as Shira indicated, that doesn't indicate that we are legally bound to the treaty, but it does indicate very strong support. And I think, I think everyone else in the world sort of gets it. I mean, they understand the, this very strange process in the United States of, you know, uh, that, that, that uh, because of our system of government, we often sign treaties that we can't ratify. Um, and, and, but I think it would be extremely important for the global process uh, for the United States to sign it as quickly as possible. That will help the momentum behind the treaty. Um, and I also agree with Shira that, that, that this treaty maybe has a better chance than the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the other controversial treaties in that 
uh, I, I think that this treaty, uh, because it is so similar to the Chafee Amendment, and because I think there's you know very very powerful argument that that no uh, implementing legislation is necessary, that we already comply with the treaty, it doesn't. Uh, restrict us or, or obligate us to change our law in any way, that that should make uh, ratification easier, uh, especially if, if sort of the, the uh, consensus that you've heard uh, in support of the treaty uh, that you've heard in the last panel and this panel, I think if, if that's the message that the Senate receives, then I think uh, uh, ratification could proceed quite quickly. Those who know me know I'm te technologically challenged, so, okay, this works. Uh, I, I, I agree with, with a lot of what has been said uh, uh, so far in terms of thinking about uh, the road ahead or the road to, to ratification. Um, in, in listening to the, uh, the, the previous panel, it, it struck me how much similarity, you know, I, I heard um, between the description of the the process to get there and um, a lot of the uh, publicity and conversations that uh, we've heard recently in connection with the 50th anniversary of the, of, of the March on Washington. And, and the connection um, that, 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 that occurred to me it was, it was just that they both sort of seem to have the same kind of leading up to it history. In other words, when you, when you look at all the reports and all the historical discussions about what happened 50 years ago, it's impossible today to find anybody who was not in favor of what happened in 1963. <laughs> um, now, I, I'm completely confident that when we, if we separate people from positions, that everyone who was on the previous panel as individuals and in their in their capacities, work really very hard to bring about this this, this particular particular result. But obviously, there were some positions um, that were, let's just say, <laughs> not immediately on the consensus side. Otherwise, they would not have had anything to talk about for for for, for all of those days. I think that uh, Justin cautioned us to listen very carefully, right? and I think that he was right to do that because if you listen very carefully to the way in which um, some of the key issues were, were characterized. One that's, that stood out for me was the characterization of the importance that the developing countries, in particular the, the, the African uh, contingent, not allow this issue to become a political football. That not, not, to not allow this issue to you know, be too connected to concerns about having precedential value for altering the, the, the system as a whole, because that's obviously going to bog this issue down. And on the surface, that sounds like very good, you know, Western logic, pragmatic advice. Listen, you know, this is something we can all agree upon. This is a good thing. Let's get it done. And tangling it with, with other things is, is going to be a, it would, would be a problem and, and is going to serve no one. Um, but by the same token, you know, we have to realize that if the overarching position is, listen, let's not do anything here that's going to give anybody the impression that we are shaking the boat, okay, that we are changing any of the fundamental structures or process that we currently live under. Well, you know, <laughs> which side of the fence does that position favor? Right. I mean, you know, certainly the the, the developing side of the word uh, of the world doesn't have a, a vested interest in things remaining status quo. Okay. So I, I say all that to say that what 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 we have to think about in terms of, of the road going forward is pretty much some of what was said on on the on the uh, previous panel that just because people walked into the room or nations walked into the room to do good things, it didn't mean that they lost their previous identities. It didn't mean that they lost their previous baggage. It didn't mean that they discarded their other concerns or, to put it uh, in, in, in the context, their larger IP and, develop, and developmental uh, 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 concerns. Uh, that may sound as if I'm pessimistic, but no. <laughs> I think that um, it just means that it's going to be daunting. It just means that there's still a great deal of work to be done, particularly right here in the, in the United States. 
But one reason why I hold out a, a, a high degree of optimism is that I think what we've seen in the last several years, a surge in IP social activism, IP public interest, IP social justice. There were constituencies that came together in some of the great IP conflicts like the SOPA conflict and the PIPA conflict of just a few years ago. Um, the traditional civil rights community played a role and had a voice in that that was much to the surprise of, 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 of many uh, mainstays in, in that community. And I think the overarching thing that I pull from all of that is that those who are in favor of this type of more progressive approach and interpretation of the intellectual property regime and, 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 and the, the objectives of, of intellectual property law. I think those coalitions have been formed. I think the constituencies that are members of that coalition have learned from the lessons of the past couple of years that it is in our collective best interest to be alert, to stay alert, that this is not the time to go back to, uh, to, go back to sleep. And, and I, I, I believe that those coalitions, coalitions are going to work very, very hard to make certain that this treaty is, is ratified because to echo a sentiment that was expressed at, at some point during the previous panel, that if the civil rights, public interest, social justice, all of those constituencies and, and, and groups, if this is a treaty that we can't get done, well, if we can't get this done, well, we can't get anything done. Danielle. Order. Thank you, Jonathan, of importance. First, I am an immediate fan of Scott after he spoke and delivered his message. That is probably my most important contribution to this discussion. Second, that I think what he and the other uh, panelists have done is uh, provided us with a framework in which to move forward. So what are my opinions about ratification and how we can implement this? Well, I would refer you to a, a percolating case, Authors Guild versus Hathis Trust, uh, the Southern District of New York. And Judge Baer there seems to be waiting for <laughs> something important like this to happen, the ratification to happen, because as he speaks in his opinion, uh, qu quoting the importance of the fair use doctrine and noting that the Chafee Amendment is not subordinated to that, that it is supplemental and additional to that, he's just waiting as an activist, I think a, a social activist as Latif says, to get the ball rolling. So I think that there are activist judges out there who are waiting for this. I think the NGOs, as was mentioned, are, are behind this. And cases like Authors Guild and their decisions, I think, are going to put pressure on this kind of ratification. Thank you. Dr. Mo. Yeah. Um, OK. Peter uh, had his hands on the brief in that case, uh, in case you wanted to know. Um, I looked at it, but Peter wrote it, you know. I think the question, is this going to be ratified, is not a question for prediction but decision. It seems to me that if we put our minds to it, get busy and go over and visit the people who have the control over it, we can make this happen. Um, I was tempted to bet Alan about whether or not he thought it would pass, but then I had to figure out how many years I'd give him. So I decided to hold back on the bet. But we got to get busy and get this done. This is a call for us to keep the pressure up. It's a call for us to keep the coalition together. It's a call for us to recognize the the, the, the arguments that have to be made, and part of this has to do with whether or not there's going to be access to information and equal opportunity for people in our society to have it. And this is a, this is a thing that's not too hard to sell to many members of the Senate. Now some senators say, I don't care what the agreement is. I don't want to give away sovereignty of the United States, and it doesn't. And so they won't vote for anything. On the other hand, it seems to me we can get 67 of them 
I think we can get this done. I think we can if we decide to do it and if we decide to get people over there and to make this thing work. I know that that's what we're going to do in the National Federation of the Blind, and I call on others to help join in this effort and to bring this off. So, Alan? And well, then I want to switch a little bit to a, a, an international perspective. Um, I mean, since I'm not confident that I sprinkled enough pessimism on this issue, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would point out that, that the other problem we have here, and, and this has to do with some, a remark I've heard several people now make about you know, what people bring into the room with them when this is going on. What, what has been so shocking about the response to the Senate recently to some of the treaties that, that uh, remain languishing there uh, is the fact that quite often the people who get to vote on the issue of ratification see things in the treaty that the rest of us may not see. Uh, in the case of the UN Convention, uh, there were 38 Republican members of the Senate who apparently saw equal access to reproductive health care as abortion rights. There were 38 Republican members of the Senate who apparently saw equal access to education as a prohibition against homeschooling. So to a large extent, you know, we will be able to explain to people, those of us who've been involved with this for so long, what we understand this document to be about, what we understand ratification to mean. It doesn't necessarily mean that the people who will be voting will accept our judgment or have the same view. And I would just point out, 2014, as everyone knows, is an interim election for the federal government. To the extent that the Republicans who voted down the UN Convention believe that they are this close to regaining the majority in the Senate, it is highly doubtful that they are going to allow uh, Obama administration judicial nominations or Obama administration negotiated trade agreements or anything else that would be an accomplishment of the Obama administration to proceed between now and the November 2014 elections if they can block it. And unfortunately, as we all know, the way the United States Senate operates, it's not very difficult to stop things from moving forward. Let me, let me shift ground a little. <laughs> um, and follow up on the point that Alan made not just now, but earlier, namely that within WIPO there are a lot of countries, a clear majority of countries in fact, for whom the requirements of this treaty, no matter how balanced and, and, and carefully negotiated, pose a challenge in the sense that nothing exists in the national laws of those countries that corresponds to the obligations that the treaty would impose. And, and Teresa, I wondered if I could start with you and ask what, what prospects you see for the ratification or accession, as the case may be, of such countries to this treaty and its effective implementation upon ratification or accession. Okay. Well, yes, I can take that question with Peter. And first of all, I'd like to thank Peter for the invitation to, um, to, to speak here today. It's my first visit to the American University, and I'm, I'm privileged to, to, to be here. Um, I'd also like to thank all the people on the previous panel, the negotiators and everyone else on the panel, who worked so intensely over the last number of years and months, and particularly in Marrakesh, over those very intense three weeks. And there was a real personal commitment on behalf of everybody there, and I think you could see that um, in, in the, the earlier panel. And, and you could also see that in the reaction when the moment that the news came out that there was an agreement. I mean, it, there was, there was laughing and crying and, and, and it was just, you know, really a, a, a special moment, a real outpouring of, of emotion. And when Stevie Wonder came to give his, uh, came to Marrakesh as he had promised to do and gave his concert, there was dancing in the aisles. 
And one delegate said to me that this was the first time that there had ever been dancing at a WIPO meeting. <laughs> So and, and let, let me just interrupt Teresa there. The reason there was dancing in the aisles is because Teresa started the dancing. <laughs> but, but first she had to get permission from this enormous bodyguard that I don't know if he was, you know, whether he was Stevie Wonders or Wipos, but once she got, and he had a pistol in the back, but once, <laughs> once Teresa got his permission, she started dancing and then everyone else started dancing. Well, who, who can't stand to superstition? I mean, it's, yeah. But in, in terms of setting a precedent, in terms of the Marrakesh Treaty setting a precedent, that was a precedent. So we can say there was one precedent. So um, coming back to your question, Peter, I mean, the, the, I think the, the, the chances of an effective implementation or, or, um, uh, of the treaty are, are good. Um, so there were 51 member states um, signed the treaty in Marrakesh, and as Shira explained earlier, signing is like a signal of intent. And that was the greatest number of WIPO member states that have ever signed a WIPO treaty immediately upon adoption of the treaty. And more, more countries will be signing over the next year. So I think that's a very positive sign and a positive signal that there is a great commitment from member states um, to ratify the treaty. And then um, in terms of implementation in the countries in which um, the, uh, I work, which is with libraries and library consortia in developing and transition countries in Africa, Asia, and, uh, and in Europe. Um, I'm working with a network of about 35 copyright librarians. And we have a strong interest in a speedy and effective implementation of the treaty for three um, main reasons. Libraries are one of the key agencies that will be delivering accessible content to blind and visually impaired people in those countries. Um, more than half of the Eiffel member countries have no uh, inadequate exceptions currently or no exceptions um, currently for blind and visually impaired people. And that was one of the findings in the 2006 WIPO study. And most of the world's blind and visually impaired people, 90%, live in developing countries. So the need is great and the need, the need is urgent. And we'll be working with all our member countries so that the national implementations are speedy. And in particular, we hope to work more deeply in a number of, a smaller number of countries in cooperation with the WBU where we see opportunities for early implementation. So for example, where there's perhaps already a copyright re review process underway or where there's a strong identified need. And we'll be working with the library community to raise awareness of the treaty raise awareness of what the issues are in the treaty that are important for libraries. We provide a guideline, guides with recommendations. We'll be doing webinars. And I, I hope that I can, um, we can invite some of the panelists who've been involved here to help us um, to spread the word and take part in that. Um, I think there's one issue of concern that we have um, with, with the, uh, well, later on, so in, uh, you know, in the post kind of implementation stage, which is that the limitations and exceptions in the treaty are not protected from contractual provisions that might restrict their use. So that will be another kind of, um, another issue that we'll be working with, with the libraries to ensure that they're vigilant and that they're not later on signing um, licenses for electronic resources to take away the provisions in the treaty, to take away the benefits of the treaty. So that would be a great pity if that was to, um, to, to happen. And I think Justin uh, said, said something in the first session, which I think is very important. You said, he said that this is the first step, and I think that's really true. So we understand that the treaty by itself is not a magic bullet that's going to solve the problem. But an international legal framework is the essential component that underpins the development of an information infrastructure that will solve the problem of the book famine. So it's like the key enabling factor that puts in place um, and that will help put in place the financial resources that are needed, the technology that's needed, and the computer equipment and all of that, the capacity building that will make it a reality. And that's why I think it's so exciting. So the foundation is in place and we'll be working hard to build on that. And that's why it's so important. 
And if I can give just three small examples um, of where uh, of situations where the treaty will help people in developing countries. Because at the end of the day, this is what the treaty is all about. It's about people and helping people to get access to accessible material. So um, in the National University of Lesotho, uh, they started taking blind students a number of years ago. And the library has a room that's equipped for visually impaired people with a Perkins Brailler and, and, and some other um, equipment. But there's still a chronic shortage of accessible books. And it takes an awful long time to get um, materials from neighboring countries, South Africa, for example, that are needed for the students. And the material simply doesn't arrive in time for the students to, to fulfill their assignments. So, so we will, you know, this will help to, to build a repository of accessible resources that, um, that that the, the, the university can use. And then uh, in Lithuania, the Lithuanian Library for the Blind is the only producer of talking books in Lithuania. They produce about uh, 200 titles annually. And they'd love to have literature also in the Russian language and in Polish for national minorities who are living in Lithuania. And now increasingly, they're getting requests from Lithuanian immigrant con immigrants communities in other countries, so in, in other European countries, in Ireland, in Germany, and also from, uh, from other countries as well. So that will enable them to, to fulfill that need, which has been arising. And then in Mongolia, in 2010, um, the social welfare law was amended. That, so that all blind people were entitled to have to get free of charge a DAISY uh, talking book player. But the DAISY Center at Ulaanbaatar Public Library can't get the rights from publishers to digitize textbooks for the school children. So at the moment, they're relying on out-of-date um, Braille uh, books that were printed uh, during the socialist, printed in Russia during the socialist period. So the, when the DAISY expert at the Ulaanbaatar Public Library heard about the treaty and heard what was happening in Marrakesh, he said to me, well, we've raised the hopes of blind people in Mongolia to read books. Copyright law can't let them down. So I think the moment that the treaty is ratified um, and, and, and comes into force after the 20 ratifications, I think we can say copyright law hasn't let them down. And that's why I think it's, it's such, a, you know, such a great day for, for, um, for, for what's happened. So we're really looking forward to implementation of the treaty and, um, so that libraries can make a real difference to blind people um, living in developing and transition countries. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to amplify one of the points that Teresa made about uh, technical assistance. Uh, that's one of the things that, that WIPO does provide uh, to developing countries. And one of the concerns we've had over the years is that the technical assistance that WIPO has given has usually been, uh, shall we say, one-sided um, and, and focused always on, on the rights and enforcements and not enough on the exceptions and limitations. And so certainly now that there is this treaty, we would hope that, that WIPO will devote more resources to uh, implementation uh, of the treaty and, frankly, to the exceptions and limitations generally. And, and we'd also like to see not only that they – and we don't want them to have to wait until you actually have you – know, the treaty comes into force, meaning you already do have the, the 51 countries that have signed it. it is, uh, there's a clearly uh, – uh, it has been adopted by, uh, you know, all 180 countries uh, in terms of – it is, it is a, 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 a treaty adopted by WIPO. Um, and so uh, I think it is a norm, uh, whether it's, again, binding is another thing, but it is a norm. And I think that WIPO already now should, in its technical assistance, should be encouraging countries to, uh, to implement it. They don't need to wait until – ratification. And so not only do we want WIPO to do that, but we would encourage the U.S. government to encourage WIPO to do that. There we go. Uh, we have, um, that is, my effort is concentrated on adoption in the U.S. However, uh, we have invited the World Blind Union to put together a, a group that will be dealing with implementation of the 
of the treaty in other countries. Um, we think that will happen either later this fall before the end of the year or very shortly after the beginning of the year. And if you have suggestions, Jonathan, about uh, resources we can use to give this broader scope, we'd be pleased to do that. Uh, it is actually time to get started, as everybody has said. The first step is to get the treaty. Now we have to get governments to buy into it. Uh, just to say that uh, we will, of course, encourage WIPO to educate people about the treaty and to implement it, but uh, believe me, they have a strong institutional interest in doing so. They like to get their treaties brought into force uh, as early as possible, and that was a big push after the 96 treaties, although it ended up taking something like 12 years, partly because the EU was so slow because of their internal process. But I'm, I'm sure they'll be eager to do that, and we will certainly encourage it. I mean, I would only say that I think they're quite supportive of the treaty. They negotiated. I think they're very happy with the outcome. I don't presume to speak for them, but I can't imagine uh, there will be any problems. Right, and, and I and I and I don't think that there's uh, that they they probably like we would not be in a position. That, I don't think any of their their countries would need to change their domestic law to comply with the treaty. I mean, it could be that some might need to make some changes, but by and large, my, my understanding is that most, if not all, of the EU countries do have uh, good exceptions for uh, the print disabled. On there. there we go. Peter says that I can uh, change the focus a little bit, if I may. There was in the last panel a comment about remuneration and being paid for your work. And I appreciated the exchange. There are some entities that take the position that access to uh, information stored in books should be free. And there are times, I think, when it should be free or at least somewhat free. Uh, and I can go on about when. But I don't think that we should try to change the model that we have established as our model for improving the livelihood of those who create interesting intellectual property. In other words, some think that this treaty means that we should get busy and establish a system where we give away everything to disabled people or print disabled people. I think that if there's a model which says we should do this and we should do it for a broader community, then I don't object. But if what it says is that you can't have the same responsibilities for disabled people that you have for able-bodied people, then I'd be against that plan. In other words, I don't want to establish with this treaty a system which says that there are two groups, one pays, one doesn't. I don't want us to fall into the trap of saying that the disabled don't have to or don't get to, depending on which way you look at it, pay their way into the same world that we expect everybody else to be in. There may be a need to have some books available because there has been so long a time when so few were. But in the long run, we have to expect from the disabled community the same responsibility 
that we expect from every other community. And that means if other people pay for their access to information, then disabled people should as well. If we create a two-class system, one class is always at a disadvantage, and I know which one it will be. So some people have said, do we expect those who are affected by this treaty to have the same responsibilities that other people do? For my part, I think it is to our great advantage if we expect that and if we require it. I said to Alan a while back, why do the publishers give their books away? And he said he didn't know. Well, I think it's a fair question. If we have one group that is the one for which charity is the model and the other for which there's another system that expects productivity and responsibility, one is always at a disadvantage and I don't want to be in the charity group. I offer that for what it may be worth because I think it's more than simply a question of whether or not a person or a group of people get paid for their intellectual efforts. I think it has to do with whether or not we are creating systems that classify people at a disadvantage, which I do not want this treaty to be interpreted to do. With, with that, let me, we have about five minutes, and I'd like to make sure that we have a chance to, to at least answer or try to answer at least one or two questions. And who would, who would have a, a, a question for the, for the group? I, I see Carrie, but I'd like, if possible, to go to people who perhaps, yes, please. Uh, so, webcast. <laughs> So uh, a question about the John, a question about uh, the relevance of sort of the U.S. adoption of the norm. Um, as I was listening to the conversation, it occurred to me that we were talking about U.S. implementation being important for the wrong reasons. On, on one hand, um, the U.S. implementation is sort of less relevant because at least back when Congress passed legislation, we'd already passed the Chafee Amendment, and so at least relatively speaking, as norms go, the U.S. is one of the most advanced. Um, and so in, from that sense, it sort of matters a lot less. Where it would actually matter is if, from the U.S. policy perspective, we treated it like we treat a lot of our other free trade or other international IP agreements. And if you look in the IP chapters of our free trade agreements, it, it doesn't actually start with norms, right? It starts with a long laundry list of all these international treaties that we require our negotiating partners to, to join. So it's, if you're going to do an FTA with us, you're going to join Paris and Bern and Madrid, the WCT and the WPPT and TRIPS. And we sort of, you know, because we have the negotiating power to do it, we ram those norms down people's throats, whether they, they like it or not. In a lot of cases, they're, they may already be parties to it, but that's part of the template. And so you know, the question is, does Marrakesh go on that list? And, and ultimately, that's probably a lot more important than whether or not, um, whether or not the, you know you can get this past folks in the Senate who you know have sort of different views. At least that's that's my contention. I'd, I'd like to hear if folks agree or disagree with that. Thoughts? Alan and Latif. Well, you know there there are a lot of political considerations around these issues. I mean. In, in, in picking up on, on Dr. Maurer's comments, we've, uh, from the very beginning, shared the view with the advocacy uh, uh, groups for, for persons with disabilities that ultimately they want them to be treated in society like any other consumers, uh, not to have to be dependent upon uh, the regulatory largesse of government. And in that sense, this treaty has to be recognized as still just another transitional step to what we all hope is ultimately going to be uh, uh, coming very uh, soon rather than later, uh, and that is the ability for persons who are blind or visually impaired or otherwise have print disabilities to go into a bookstore or a big box store and buy exactly the same product that somebody without those disabilities can buy uh, and still be able to use it, um, and, and even though they'd be using it in a somewhat adaptive fashion. 
one of the problems with this treaty, with the discussions about the treaty, was there really wasn't any recognition or, or any uh, consideration that manifested itself in the way the treaty itself was shaped uh, to indicate the fact that as we're getting closer to that goal, and we are, because digital technology now creates capabilities that didn't exist when the Chafee Amendment was enacted in 1996, but as we're getting closer to that goal, we're going to see ultimately a time when the availability in commercial markets uh, of those kinds of accommodations that are just simply built in to consumer products is hopefully going to make this kind of system obsolete. And what we did not discuss during the course of the negotiations over this treaty, uh, although it was the ultimate uh, basis for many of the discussions about commercial availability and what role that would play in a treaty of this kind is how are we going to deal with the limitations and exceptions regime when ultimately the markets do allow people with disabilities to purchase works that they can use uh, in the same way as individuals without disabilities. So when we talk about, you know, how the U.S. Uh, insists that its trade partners, in order to be part of an agreement, uh, have to adopt essentially uh, the same kind of approach to certain areas of law as, as the United States has done. There's a recognition there, as there was in the discussions in Geneva and in Marrakesh with this treaty, that there are going to be uh, a relatively few nations that are going to be the net exporters of accessible format copies of works and there are going to be many more that will be net importers of those accessible format copies. So the effort to try to develop level playing fields in trade is what drives these policies that were mentioned by that gentleman with respect to the U.S. posture and trade agreements. It also was uh, an undercurrent of many of the discussions that took place in Geneva and Marrakesh. But I think ultimately, uh, because of the immediate need to try to improve the situation of availability of works that can be used around the world by people with print disabilities, we didn't go so far as to think that far ahead as to how this scheme is going to fit into a world where hopefully we will achieve the goal of turning everyone with disabilities into consumers who can use the marketplace in exactly the same way as people without disabilities can. <coughs> Latif, the, the, our la literally last minute together is yours. <laughs> okay, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, um, Alan uh, covered a, a great deal of, of, of the necessary response to, uh, uh, to the question. Um, with respect to the Chafee uh, versus the, the treaty issue, uh, what Alan pointed out about the technological differences, um, there is, and, and Danielle made a similar comment of the, about the pending uh, patent trust case, there are some potential differences between what can be done in terms of formats um, under the Chafee uh, uh, Amendment and uh, what arguably are broader things that can be done um, under the treaty. So on a micro level, um, that's one issue. In terms of the macro issue that I think you, you raised, is, okay, so what is this going to mean in terms of the United States as an IP world leader? And actually, it, it really resonates with something that I think sort of implicitly came up in, in terms of the, uh, of the other panel. And, and, and that's that, uh, realistically, again, none of this is done in, in a vacuum. Um, at first blush, it may seem as if there are uh, countries, in, nations in, in the developing world that would automatically just say, yes, you know, this is what, what we have to do. But we have to keep in mind that they, are, they have bigger fish to fry and they're in a bigger pond, all right? <laughs> and by having to, as a minnow, having to negotiate with, um, I'm trying to think of a big fish that is not a barracuda <laughs> or a shark, uh, <laughs> but a larger fish, okay, <laughs> You may have to make some concessions in terms of the position that you take insofar as a treaty of this kind is, is, is concerned because, you know, 
you have to look at the needs of your people and the nation as a whole. Um, that said, what that really means is that we, meaning the constituents in, in, in the United States, what we have to do is that we have to put, let's not say pressure, we have to make it very clear, we have to illuminate uh, the fact that the United States now has an opportunity to um, utilize its position in the global trade context to, to, to take a lead position that's going to be, be the difference between are we going to be perceived as being IP progressive or are we going to be seen as being IP imperialistic, right? So are we going to put the pressure on other nations to, quote, play ball with us on other issues in order to get this done? Or are we going to remain true to the sentiment that was expressed earlier today that, no, listen, this is different. This is the morally correct position to take. We're not going to swing a big stick in terms of other issues. We're just all going to be on the same page as far as this is concerned. I think it's going to be our responsibility to remind our leaders in Congress that that is the position that we would prefer to take. Thank you so much. And let us thank the panel for this extraordinary discourse.